Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast, where we look forward to shaving every day. Welcome to episode 95 of the podcast. My name is Rick Louise. I'll be your host this week. Okay, so this week we're starting off with a couple of emails, one from David, one from Chris. Got a couple of shaves of the day, including uh, over the weekend, the importance of knots. I, I went to the to the store, had a, a something to put in the truck, and realized that not everybody knows how to do these things. Another shave of the day. Um, I just it was a conversation uh, that that we had on on Facebook about something. Uh, let me tell you how I iron my shirts. It takes a minute and a half. I'll tell you how. Um, the pen of the week. Uh, I'm, I'm playing with a new one. I'll tell you all about it. Another uh, Wednesday uh, shave of the day uh, that kind of everything fell together. And uh, we may, may not be the, uh, the the lonely ones out here. It might be the other guys. <laughs> we'll talk about that, too. So uh, thank you very much for coming along. Um, as always, if you have any comments or uh, want to get in touch, have suggestions or, uh, or whatever, uh, drop me a line. Throw me an email at brushandsoapandblade at uh, gmail.com. Um, this week, uh, we're continuing on with, uh, with our, our fine selection of deluxe shaving soaps. Um, so uh, just uh, I've got them, so I'm going to uh, check them out. And uh, then we'll do something with them. So, uh, but right now, uh, I'm enjoying uh, all the scents and all the flavors. And uh, yeah, it's kind of like being at the buffet. It's uh, it's pretty cool. Anyhow, let's get on with this show. So, I got a letter from David. Hi, Rick. You haven't heard from me for a while, but I'm still listening to your weekly ramblings, which I enjoy a lot. Keep up the great work. I recently discovered Meissner Tremonia, a new artisan soap maker from Germany whose soaps are absolutely phenomenal. Have you heard of them? Uh, no, I haven't. So uh, I, I've got a link now. So uh, I'll go and uh, check them out and see what I can uh, see what I can discover there. Anyhow, he goes on. If you get a chance to get your hands on some of their soaps or some samples, go ahead. I think you won't be disappointed. Well, thank you very much, David. I appreciate the letter, um, uh, the email. And uh, David is lucky. He lives over there in, in Germany. And uh, so it's uh, it's nice to know that there are artisan soap makers over there as well. So I'll put a link in the show notes. And uh, if anybody else is uh, over in Germany or at least in the area, uh, you know, you can uh, you can go check things out over there, and uh, this one's got a recommendation. So I'll see what I can do on this end, and uh, who knows, maybe I can get my hands on some, uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, anyhow, thank you very much. Uh, if anybody else has any recommendations of good stuff that uh, folks haven't heard of or that uh, seem a bit unusual, um, give me a call, send me an email, and uh, let me know, and we'll uh, we'll spread the word around. So thank you very much once again for the letter. I got an email from Chris. Hi, Rick. I know this is off topic, but I also know you're a ham operator, so I wanted to direct an electrical question to you. I understand if you don't have the time to go in the explanation, but perhaps you could point me to an information source. I have a standard AM FM radio with a wire window antenna like everyone else these days. There's a station that I enjoy listening to, but it is on FM and it is sketchy to pick up. Partially because of distance, but also because there are other distance stations very close to that frequency. Is there any way I could increase the reception of the radio and maybe filter out the other stations that are bleeding over? I just wonder if there's perhaps an external filter I could put on the antenna input. I'm sure that would not be uh, not be the case, though, as it would make things way too simple. I appreciate any help or info you can provide. God bless, Chris. Okay, so, Chris, um, yeah, ham radio operator, and the problem that you run into here is kind of twofold. First, there is a, uh, you know, the like you stated, the antenna that you have is a wire antenna that is in your uh, in your window. Um, those work okay, and they really work well in areas that are, you know, fairly high signal strength, you know, buildings, cities, things like that, where you get signal just bouncing all over the place. Um, when you start getting out into the boonies, they get a little bit sketchy. 
um, the uh, the best place, I mean, the absolute best place to put an antenna is right in the center of your uh, of your roof. Um, you can pull that back a little bit. Uh, most places, uh, you know, most cars, the, if they have external antennas, they either put it all the way in the back, like on an SUV up above the hatch, or they uh, they put it on the front fender somewhere. The front fender is okay, but uh, what you end up having to do is you have to filter it because of potential interference from uh, from the uh, the electronics that are going on inside your engine bay, spark plugs, ignition, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so there is some filtering that already goes on, and and you know it's a it's a pretty good compromise to put your antenna there. Now the other issue that you have and. Uh, is just within the radio itself, and that's the ability of the the radio to separate out signals. Now, the problem that you run into is that, um, you know, separating out signals is really kind of a uh, kind of the thing for FM radio. It's uh, it's a lot better at doing it than AM radio is. AM radio, you actually have to. There's a there's a company called uh, CC Crane. And uh, they made a business model uh, of making radios for AM that have much finer selectivity than most, and so you can pull those stations out. But there really hasn't, hasn't ever been a market for doing that within FM. So about the only thing that I could suggest is... Uh, you know, if it's a if it's a fairly new car and has a has a fairly new radio in it, you're probably looking at uh, about the best you can get from a radio standpoint. <clears throat> but uh, you know, about the only thing you could do potentially is try a uh, a different antenna. The problem with that, of course, is that then you have to get to where the antenna is connected to the radio and all that other stuff, and so you end up running into a situation where it's kind of uh, it gets a little hairy after a while, especially in in you know new cars. You know, one thing that I could suggest is uh, check to see if the radio station is playing on the internet. And the reason I say that is that there are a lot of stations that play on the internet. Go to the uh, radio's website, or even call the radio up uh, station up and say, "Hey, do you play on the internet?" Um, you know, if you don't get uh, internet signals. Uh, you know, if, if you don't get, uh, like Wi-Fi, uh, where you're at, or if you're traveling, sometimes they do thing, you know, they do podcasts sometimes. And so that's a, that's a very viable option. Uh, but you know, about the only thing I could say is maybe put another antenna on your car, but again, depending on the car, that can be a real pain. So, uh, as far as I know, they don't make a filter. They make, uh, amplifiers. Um, but it amplifies everything, and the problem is, is that if you're getting, uh, if you're getting signals that are, you know, basically stacked right on top of the station that you want, if you throw an amplifier on that, well, it amplifies all of it. It amplifies the 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 weak station you're trying to hear, and the other station that's right on top of it. You know, it just amplifies it all. It's there's not really a filter that you can do when it comes to FM radio. Um, so. That's about all. If you know, if somebody else knows anything different about FM radios, uh, let me know. Um, you know, there there are filters and things that you can put on ham radios, but uh, they're more for uh, for narrowing down the uh, the amount of band that you're actually listening to, uh, and they do that uh, for for some things. But uh, as far as FM radio, uh, I don't know what you can do there. So, like I said, if anybody else knows anything else, uh, give me a shout and I'll throw it on the air. And if I'm wrong, well, I'll admit it. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, thank you very much for the letter. Yeah, a little off topic, but hey, what the heck? It's all fun, right? So let's talk about the shave of the days uh, that, that we've had this week. Okay, so Thursday's shave of the day was with uh, Cool Daddio once again, which uh, is a combination, and a rather nice combination, of bergamot, uh, orange, and menthol. And I've really enjoyed this. I use this with my uh, with my aristocrat just because that's what I had, and that's what you know had uh, had a feather blade in there, and uh, all was good with the world. And uh, the shaving cream, of course, was uh, deluxe shaving cream. Um, you know, cool daddy o. It's a very very nice uh, nice scent. Really really liked it. 
it's um you know it's a it's a menthol soap but uh, quite honestly what i what i found in the past is some of the menthols that i had um and, and maybe my tastes have evolved yeah that's what politicians say right my my view on the uh, on the subject has evolved yeah okay maybe um but uh what i found was that in a lot of cases menthol is well kind of annoying well, to be quite honest, um, especially when it's kind of hot and humid and everything else, um, this is a real nice soap. You know, kind of just set my, you know, between the label, the, the, the name of it, the smells, it, it, it kind of set my mind to New Orleans. You know, it's just, uh, it, it was, it was good. It, uh, I really enjoyed it. So, uh, you know, it, it lathered up well, um, you know, lathered it up with the, uh, with the boar brush and, uh, you know, uh, proceeded to shave with the aristocrat with the feather blade in it. And well, all was good in, in the world. And in fact, I didn't even, uh, you know, I didn't throw on any aftershave just because, well, I wanted to smell that orange. Um, and it, to me, anyhow, sitting here smelling it. Um, it's a little bit more orange than, than anything else. And it's just, it's nice. It's, it's well balanced. It's, um, uh, you know, the, the, the menthol doesn't, isn't really annoying. Of course, now what I, what I kind of reflected on is that in the past, um, I believe I had been using menthols in, you know, the late fall, early winter, that time period. And I, I think for me, anyhow, the menthol works um, and is not annoying when it's warm. Um, whereas when it's cold, the menthol just kind of, eh. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it, it just doesn't strike the same tone, if you will. So, uh, very nice shave of the day and uh, very, very enjoyable. So then the shaves of the day that we uh, that we ran into over the weekend was, uh, well, in in this case, um, it was straight razor time and uh, just because, well, I had the time. And so whipped out the little, uh, you know, my little case straight razor and kind of because I had a tobacco yellow handle on it, it just kind of set the mood, if you will, for uh, trying out Deluxe Shaving Tobacco Road, which is a tobacco and vanilla scent. That is an interest. It's it's well balanced. It's uh, it's it's almost you know from a smell standpoint between those two smells between tobacco and vanilla, it's about you know even you know one's not bigger than the other. One's not uh, one's not higher than the other. It's uh, it's just even and it works well. And, uh, you know, the other tobacco scent, uh, that I have is, uh, is from How to Grow a Mustache. And, uh, it's not that kind of a smell. That's more of a Cavendish smell, a particular, uh, scent of tobacco, if you will. Um, but not that, uh, not that kind. This is, this is a different tobacco smell. And with the vanilla, it turns out to be really, really nice. Now, you know, lathered that up with the uh, with the boar brush, and I find that I just because I can, I have been using uh, my 830 boar brush more than I have my 1305, um, mainly just because, uh, well, it's just kind of sitting there, and I haven't used it in a while, and so, well, you know, give it a little attention, a little love, if you will. Now, uh, you know, lathered up nicely, and again, very, very nice scent, and it is... Uh, it it is interesting that the scent that you smell out of the jar it does evolve and and I've noticed it a lot in these uh, in these soaps it does uh it does evolve into a little bit more of a uh a mature scent you know there's it's when it's in the jar it's it's almost sharp and uh so, you know, when lathering up, it's, it's nice because it, it, it evolves a little bit. It's not quite as sharp. It's a little bit easier on the nose, if you will. So, uh, you know, that was good. So, you know, once, once we got everything lathered up and, uh, you know, got the, uh, got the razor stropped and, uh, you know, it's, it, it still always amazes me that something as simple as stropping a razor can make such a difference. It, 
it really does. You know, if if you have a razor that you don't strop often or you don't strop well, it it pulls and you can feel it and it it drags and and if you have a well stropped razor and you can hear it, there's almost a if you've ever taken a piece of iron and dropped it on the ground so that it kind of bounces up and it's not touching anything but it's vibrating, kind of gives that ring. Um, to me, anyhow, I, if I'm stropping it correctly, I can hear just a a slight ringing of that edge as I go back and forth, and it's a it's a beautiful sound. It absolutely is a beautiful sound. And then, of course, it could be that I'm doing something just completely wrong. But <laughs> anyhow, that's uh, that's one of the things that I've noticed, and uh, I do thoroughly enjoy that. So I had a very nice shave with it. Um, didn't have any difficulties or issues, although, although, you know, again, that particular razor, the 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 case razor, has a very narrow blade. And uh, and if I'm not careful, I can um, get the angle just a little bit wrong, hook myself, whatever. And, yeah, I gave myself a slight, well, not really a nick. It was more of a slight cut. It wasn't very deep, but uh, it, it was, in fact, a, sl- uh, a slight cut. Now, the... Uh, the the thing that that went with that then of course uh that i finished up with that worked out very very nicely was stetson i used some stetson aftershave balm and uh you know between the leathery smell and kind of a leathery tobacco smell that goes on in the stetson with the tobacco road i mean it really just it kind of set it, it was a good combination. I, I really enjoyed it. It was one of those that you kind of walk away from going, wow, that actually worked. Pretty cool. So anyhow, that was uh, that was a Saturday shave of the day. And quite honestly, uh, when Sunday rolled around, I, you know, and I don't do this very often, I didn't shave. I didn't, I just, I didn't get around to it. I thought about it and I said, nah, I'll do it Monday. And, uh, you know, I was off doing other things and, um, uh, it was just one of those days. Sometimes you got to take a break. You know, give your give your face a rest, if you will. And so that's what I did. So one of the things that I was doing this weekend is, well, I have a deck, and uh, I have a deck in the back, and uh, underneath the deck is you know just stuff and things and so I want you know a, a long time ago I wanted to pretty that up and so I put some uh, some plastic lattice underneath there to uh, to make that well look just a little bit nicer and uh, you know then I painted everything up and and uh, between the uh, the white lattice and then I painted the railings white and I mean it's just it looked much much nicer. Um, so over time, those uh, those lattice panels, because when I put them in initially, I didn't support them quite the way I should. And, I mean, they've lasted probably about five years or so, um, but they were starting to wear and break and tear up and everything. So I I wanted to replace them. So I went down to uh, down to the uh, store and picked some up. Now the uh, the pickup truck that i that, that i have if i lower the tailgate it's a short bed and so if i lower the tailgate i can get an 8 foot sheet of plywood in between the wheel wells and you know it kind of sits there on the tailgate well a couple of the pieces that i bought to do some other work around the house extended well beyond the tailgate and whether they had you know gone beyond the tailgate or not it doesn't really matter but it was one of those things that kind of sticks out okay <laughs> literally <laughs> so as i was sitting there um i i was i was loading things up and uh, i got some of the uh, the inexpensive you know kind of plastic twine that they sell at you know they give you at those stores to uh, well secure the load which you know works now, it's not heavy duty rope or anything like that but i'm not traveling very far and all i needed to do is not slide around especially slide out so, uh, uh, you know, as I was sitting there with this chunk of rope, um, I realized without even, uh, I don't know, kind of thinking about it, that I had thrown a, a, a bowline on one side of it and hooked it to the, uh, to the truck bed. I had then thrown three half hitches around the long pieces sticking out of the bed and then gone back and hooked it back into the bed with a trucker's hitch and two half hitches. 
And all of them, you know, the bowling and the half hitches were slips so that I could take them apart easily. And as I, as I stood there looking at this, I, I was, I, I was struck because I have seen other people load things into their vehicles and I have seen other people, you know, put ropes and things like that on their stuff. And in fact, I've helped, well, untie some of these loads. And the thing that struck me is that inherently we as men don't necessarily know, at least not all of us, um, how to do knots. Now, granted, I understand I'm a scoutmaster, and it's just kind of one of the things that I do. But, um, you know, the bowling knot, for example, is a knot that doesn't slip. So you put that on the uh, on the part that you're starting off on because that's your foundation, and you don't want that to slip. The half hitches, which, you know, if you throw two half hitches around something, it's essentially a clove hitch, and you throw another one around and you just increase the surface area. Well, in the particular application, I'm going to throw a picture up of this thing. In the particular application that I have, and there's a lot of knots that are like this, the fact that they have more wraps around it increases their surface area. And it's the surface area that actually, you know, keeps things in its, in their place and keeps things secure. But a lot of people don't know that. They just, you know, throw a knot around this thing, call it a granny knot, and keep on trucking. The problem is, is that the drive down the road and, you know, fast acceleration or something like that, and they get over, you know, to the house and they wonder, why is it that this board has slipped out of this knot about, you know, three, four inches or feet or whatever, you know? And for some situations, you're probably thinking, well, that's not a big deal, and you're right. But if you happen to have to, you know, if you happen to have to travel a distance, then all of a sudden having the board slip every now and then is not necessarily a good thing. You know, on the other end, then, a sl- uh, you know, a, a, a trucker's hitch, in order to tighten the load as much as possible, um, you know, th- there are a lot of people that don't know how to do that. And so this is, you know, ag- again, I was struck by by the fact that, that people don't, they don't strive to learn in a lot of situations. Now, to a certain extent, a lot of the people, well, in this community, in uh, in the wet shaving community, have done exactly that with the hobby. They they have gone out of their way, and they are in the process, in a lot of cases, striving to learn how to uh, do this stuff, how to get a good shave, how to enjoy single edge, double edge, straight razors, how to enjoy lathering with good artisan soaps. In some cases, how to make those soaps, how to make the brushes, you know, how to make the razors in some cases. So there is within this community a striving to learn. And what I'm suggesting is that we might want to strive to learn some other things so that, and this is the most important part, so that we can teach our children. Um, You know, my sons, they know how to tie knots but they don't know, really, practical applications for them. You know, they've done knots because, well, those are some of the challenges that we do in scouting, and, you know, they might use one from time to time with a tent or something like that, but they don't do them enough. They they, they don't have the opportunities for practical applications to actually learn what what do you do with these things called knots? Why do I have to learn them? What's the important part of it? Why you know what's the big deal? And so uh, you know it, it was one of those things that struck me. So if you have an opportunity, teach your kids knots, learn knots yourself, and go out of your way, just like we do, kind of with shaving. Go out of your way to figure out what am I supposed to do with these things? How do these work? Why do they work? And what can I do with them? So Monday's shave of the day was, well, absolutely fantastic. Now, uh, one of the things that I have been doing is is I have shaved with straight razors and double-edged razors. And I'm kind of, you know, I piddle farted around with those things for a while. 
but I haven't really used, um, I don't know, consistently anyhow, um, one of my single-edged razors. And I enjoy single-edged razors. There is a simplicity about the things. I mean, it's, uh, you know, they're not quite as simple as, say, a three-piece tech or something like that, but there is a simplicity about just the, the mechanism and the and the way they're put together, and it's just, I don't know, I enjoy them. Now, the other thing that I enjoy is my PAL carbon steel blades. Now, I've also got some gem stainless blades, and, I mean, they're okay, but I like the, I don't know, if if blades have a soul, if that makes sense, um, I enjoy the soul of a carbon steel blade. There's just, it to me, Okay, and this is just me. And again, blades are like just everything else in wet shaving. They are so subjective, okay? So this is all personal, you know, personal likes, dislikes, etc. And, you know, as far as that goes. But I enjoy the feel of a carbon steel blade. They feel sharper. They feel smoother. And when I get done with the shave, it feels like, well, it just did a better job. Um... You know, to me, I've always joked that a uh, that the uh, single-edged razors are like a straight razor on a stick. Now, for me, the reason that they feel that way is because of, well, that carbon steel blade. Um, that carbon steel blade is what makes them feel like, well, the straight razor on the stick. And I thoroughly enjoy that about it. So... The the single-edged razor that I picked up was a gem featherweight. Now, the gem featherweight has a plastic handle on it. It's a white plastic handle that is, for my hands, um, and again, a subjective thing, but for my hands, probably the best handle design of a razor that I've ever held. Um, you know, it's it's not expensive to make, but it is the grip is sure it's solid it's it's thick in width but it's fairly thin in in you know thickness so it's uh it's just i don't know for me it works it's got kind of a hook on the bottom of it so that you know it doesn't slide it's got a good grip when it's wet it's got a good grip when it's dry i mean it's just it's a good little razor Easy to load. The the top cap flips up, and the blades, you know, you kind of slide in, and then have to slide around the hooks, and then you drop the uh, the top cap back into place. And it's just overall, it's a very very nice razor that I really enjoy. Now, one of the things that I have noticed about it is that it does, and it it picked it up somewhere. And so this is something that you got to watch out for. You know, the other day I was talking about you know tarnish and things like that on the uh, on the double-edged razors on the caps. Well, that holds true with uh, with single-edged razors, too. If there's soap scum or something like that that is on the cap, it will it will cause a, uh, a drag effect, and it'll feel like the soap is not performing well, and so you need to make sure that, uh, that things are cleaned off um, nicely so that when you use it, it does, in fact, glide well. Um, because the top cap is designed to basically rest almost up against your face. I mean, you know, it's it's a completely different experience than a double-edged razor. So uh, that's what I've been using, PAL uh, carbon steel blades, and uh, that I actually pick up at the uh, at the uh, uh, gas station. It's just that they have them, and and I buy them, and they keep getting them, and I keep buying them. It's just it's it's really one of those interesting things. They're not scraper blades; they're actually shaving blades. Um, and you know they sell them, or I, I think when they bought them originally, they bought them as scraper blades, but they're really razor blades, you know, for for shaving, and I, they do a great job for me. So um, so anyhow, that that's kind of on the razor front front. Now the 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 shaving cream or the you know the the, the shaving soap that I'm using um, is a, another deluxe and it's a deluxe because well I have them and so it's nice to be able to kind of go through a whole lot of soaps to to you know see what's what's on the buffet if you will well the one that that I tried on Monday was Soul Man and Soul Man is orange bourbon 
and vanilla. Now, the curious thing is that, okay, orange and vanilla do not necessarily make a soap dark. You know, if I look, I've got tobacco and vanilla, and it's kind of a, a very light tan colored soap. Um, the, the, uh, cool daddio is orange and, uh, and menthol and bergamot, and it's a white soap. So when I open up the jar of Soul Man, which is orange bourbon and vanilla, it's brown. It's kind of a, uh, a dark brown, you know, um, smells fabulous. Oh my gosh, it smells fabulous. But, it's brown, and it's like, well, I wasn't really expecting that. That's kind of cool. And uh, so the the smells, okay, the orange and the vanilla is just a, a an absolutely great uh, combination. You know, to be quite honest, you know, it's kind of like a that part of it, just the orange and the vanilla is creamsicle. <laughs> ah, good stuff. Now, of course, the bourbon adds an interesting note that is kind of off to the side that, you know, kind of makes it so that it's a, well, it's a grown-up creamsicle. <laughs> it's it's really a good smell. I, I, yeah, it, it, it really was a good smell, and I enjoyed the shaves that I got with this stuff, mainly because... As that, as that smell evolved as I was lathering it, it really, well, it really came through. It, it, it kind of came into its own and just, uh, it, it just became uh, just thoroughly enjoyable. It, it was enveloping. It was calming. It was, it was good stuff. And, uh, you know, it was another one of those that, that I, I shaved with and found myself at the end of the shave not looking for an aftershave didn't need one. It was just, and, and I don't know if that's just, you know, cause the ones that I've done that with have been orange, you know, they've had, had orange in them. So I don't know if, if that's the component that I enjoy that it's just like, well, you know, um, now the problem is, is that in my head, I'm thinking, you know, there is a, an aftershave that would go with this very, very nicely. And it is, uh, uh, l'orange noir. Um, from, uh, from Jalou. Unfortunately, I don't have any. Um, but, uh, I need to get some because, uh, that would be a good combination with those orange soaps. So, uh, all in all, good stuff. And, uh, I, I, like I said, I am enjoying being at the, uh, smorgasbord of, uh, deluxe shaving soaps and deluxe shaving, uh, uh, you know, smells and, and everything else. And, and they have performed very, very nicely. I haven't seen one that performs differently than the other. They all seem to use the same base and all seem to be just, you know, the, you know, uh, the same very good performance that has not disappointed in any way. So, uh, you know, it was just one of those shaves that everything kind of, you know, worked and, uh, I, I enjoyed it. Okay. So this next segment came to me, um, because of a comment on Facebook, this guy was asking or talking about um, ironing shirts. And one of the things that he made the comment on is that it took him like 20 minutes to iron a shirt, at which point the alarm bells just started going off. And, and I thought to myself, OK, is it just me? Um, because if I take, for example, a short sleeve shirt. And granted, it's not a long sleeve, it's a short sleeve, so it's a little bit simpler. But from start to finish, for ironing, once I have the ironing board out, the iron is hot, and the iron is filled with water because it is a steam iron, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, I can do a shirt in a minute and a half. Uh, and so quite honestly, you know, what I typically do is if I'm making breakfast, um, I, I typically make breakfast in a cast iron pan, and so I will put the pan on the oven. Um, I will turn it on medium to let it heat up. I will go set up the ironing board, plug in the iron, and turn the iron on, make sure that it's filled with water, and take the minute or two that it takes to do that. Come back, put some bacon grease in the uh, in the cast iron pan, and then while that is heating up, I go iron my shirt. 
And about the time that I'm done ironing my shirt and uh, have it on and everything put away, I come back and the uh, the the bacon grease in the cast iron pan is starting to smoke lightly, which is an indication that it's ready to go and I can commence cooking my breakfast. So I you know I was I was thinking about it and thinking, okay, how do I you know, iron a shirt. And, and so I just want to tell you, you know, it may be that I'm different, but this is the way that I've always done it. And this is the way that I was taught um, by my mom as a teenager, because uh, she wanted me to be able to cook my own food, clean my own clothes, iron my own clothes, and basically, you know, vacuum and, and you know, things like that. Uh, she wanted me to be able to, if I was living alone, to, you know, have a decent life and, uh, and, you know, keep everything neat and clean and tidy and, you know, you know, like that. Okay, so, the first thing I do, unbutton the shirt. Um, unbutton the shirt includes unbuttoning the collars. If it's got collar stays, pull the collar stays out, okay, because you want just cloth. Now, the, the iron is important. You need an iron that has steam capabilities. Um, I, I can iron a shirt without steam. It does take longer. It is not as efficient. Um, now, the majority of shirts that I do are cotton or cotton blend. Um, you know, pure synthetics or, uh, or silks or something like that. That's kind of a different story. So I'm just going to talk about the plain cotton blend shirt. That's what I'm using. So it comes out of the dryer and, you know, it gets thrown in a laundry hamper. You don't hang it up right, you know, real quick or anything or, or you have too many shirts and they all get kind of thrown in the closet on the, on the, uh, on the, you know, the, the, the curtain or the, the rod in the, uh, in the closet. And, uh, you know, they're all jumbled up in there and they get wrinkled. And, um, so start off with the shirt completely unbuttoned, um, collar unbuttoned, collar stays out. The first thing that you want to do is lay the collar, um, so that the, so that you're looking at the back side of the shirt and the back side of the collar. That way, if anything happens, if you have any staining or, you know, I've had irons where they're Teflon coated, where the Teflon comes off or somebody's ironed something before and there's like gunk on the iron, it's on the back of the collar so that if nothing else, you don't ruin your shirt. Um, but the first thing you need to do is get the collar and the part of the, you know, the back of the shirt there, you know, where the collar is, the neck area there, get that flat, just, just lay it out. Iron it, get it flat. Okay. Now comes the next step, and this is where you save a lot of time. When when I was growing up, my grandmother would always use the pointy end of the iron. Everything that she ironed, and it didn't matter what it was, she used the pointy end of the iron. But most iron or of the ironing board. But most ironing boards, if you look at them, they have two ends. They have one that is the pointy end, and they have the other end, which is the square end. Well, it just so happens that the square end is the only end, for the most part, that I ever use. Because if I take my shirt, and if I put one side of the front and lay it out, it covers that square end perfectly. And I can lay it out flat and smooth and run the iron over that, and I have done one panel of four of that shirt. And I am a quarter way done with the shirt. The body of it, anyhow. And so that's what I do. So I typically start on um, on the left side of the shirt. And put the left side on the ironing board. Iron that. Flip it around a little bit so that I can get the left back side. Iron it. Slide it over. Right back side. Slide it over, right front side, and I'm I'm done. I'm done with the body of the shirt. And that right there takes about a minute. It really does. It doesn't take long at all. And so I wonder if people are struggling with an iron um, because they're using the wrong end of the ironing board. And again, when I watch my grandmother iron, that was the only end she ever used. It was like the, the, the square end didn't even, didn't even exist for her just the pointy end. Well, I'm kind of backwards, I guess. But, you know, I use the square end because it fits the shirt. It allows me to lay the fabric of the shirt down flat. Boom, done. 
um, and I'm good to go. Now after that, you uh, you lay the shirt out so that the sleeves are flat, iron them in one pass, boom, you're done. Um, I may do a little bit of touch up if it's a long sleeve on the uh, on the co- uh, on the cuff, uh, just so that it's uh, you know it's smooth, and uh, and that's about it. But you're looking at about a minute and a half to two minutes. Now, why bother? Well, it's the same reason that we shave, and the reason to bother is so that you look neat. Because if you're amongst people that do not have ironed shirts, and you do, you will stand out to everyone. And if you start looking around, you will notice people have ironed shirts and some that don't. And you can tell. It's pretty easy to tell. Um, and it just adds one more, well, style point, if you will. And that style point is added to, well, whomever you meet, male, female, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, You know, the ability to to have style, to be well-groomed, both in your shave, your hair or haircut, the clothes that you wear, how you wear them. You know, the fact that you have your uh, a button-down shirt, for example, that... The buttons, you know, the platen of the buttons lines up with the trousers. It's called a gig line, and everything lines up, and your belt buckle is right there, and everything is in a nice straight line, and smooth and correct, almost almost military in crispness, but, well, not quite. A little bit more casual than that, but at the same time, very sharp, very neat, very professional looking, very much, well, on top of your game. That gives you a distinct advantage in the world. Um, it gives you a distinct advantage in the workplace. It gives you a distinct advantage in talking and meeting people. Well, it just gives you a distinct advantage. It's kind of like shaving. If you're well-groomed and well-dressed, well, there you go. There's not much left, is there? Well, except for some, you know, shined shoes. But, um, you know, if if we can walk out ahead of the game so that you can walk out relaxed, confident, not have to stress out over. So I have been playing with a different pen this week, so we'll call this segment the pen of the week. Well, just because. Okay, so first off, I have something to report. Um, my knock, my, my pilot uh, vanishing point pen, uh, well, it's there's one part of it that's coming apart. It's rather obnoxious. It's uh, it's irritating me. I don't like it, but it is. It's coming apart, um, and so I'll have to fix it. And uh, I will probably fix it sometime this week. I do have the materials to fix it. But what it is, if you look at the vanishing point pen, um, the uh, there's a button that fits on top of this thing that just like a ballpoint pen, you push and it exposes the nib out of the bottom of the pen. Well, there is a round collar at the, uh, you know, at the top of the pen that the button goes through. And this thing has come loose. And so there is about a, I don't know, maybe a four millimeter, uh, gap that this thing slides up and down on. And it's just, it's loose. And I noticed it the other day and, uh, I was like, what the heck? That's not good. So after uh, after doing a little bit of research, I went and I've got some um, some some GS Hypno uh, cement and uh, picked it up at Hobby Lobby, and uh, it's got a precision applicator. And so uh, you know this uh, this weekend I will apply this stuff uh, judiciously around that cap, and then uh, put that thing back together again. Now hold it in place so that hopefully it cements and will stay in place for another, I don't know, five, ten years while I'm using this pen every now and then. And uh, all will be good with the world. Now, that's the repair, but the pen that I have is uh, is one that I actually picked up at Hobby Lobby. And this is a Schaefer calligraphy pen. It is a um, a medium nib, but it is a kind of a broad flat nib. Now, you're thinking, okay, you know, you picked up a pen, uh, and so it's a fountain pen, and it's probably expensive. Okay, I picked this thing up at Hobby Lobby. It was nine bucks. 
Okay, so I happen to get yellow, and uh, it's a pretty decent little pen. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it you know it writes well. It uh, it seems to flow well. Um, I didn't have to do any special cleaning of it, although I probably should have. It probably would have flowed a little bit better. Um, the only downside that I have with it at this point is that it does take Schaefer ink cartridges, which are different, of course, than any other ink cartridge as far as the, uh, you know, the, the throat and everything else. Um, and so far, the one that I have, because I do a lot of writing, I take notes, pages of notes. Um, but this ink cartridge has lasted me, eh, call it just shy of a week, you know, maybe, maybe three days, four days. Okay. Um, so, and, and they're not cheap. So, uh, that's the one downside, but it is a very nice pen and I thoroughly enjoy, uh, writing with it. So I'm going to have to look and see if, uh, if I can get a converter for this thing. And, uh, and if not, what other options I have, uh, to, uh, to try to figure out, you know, what I can do. Because I do like the pen. It, it writes very, very nicely. And I was thinking while I was, while I was playing with it this week that, uh, you know, if somebody wanted to get started in fountain pens and didn't want to spend a lot of money, cause some of these pens, I mean, they, uh, yeah, they can be a bit pricey. But, uh, you know, if somebody wanted to get, uh, started, they could go down to Hobby Lobby and pick up a, uh, little Schaefer calligraphy pen and at least, at least be able to experience the difference between a, a fountain pen and like a ballpoint pen. Now, I would probably suggest getting the fine nib. They've got a, I, I saw a fine nib there and I got a, and, and I saw the medium, which, which I picked up. I picked up a, a medium and there are several different colors. And so it might not be a bad choice. Um, again, just to, uh, you know, just to try it out if you haven't, because there is a distinct difference. Now, the other thing, of course, that makes a, a very nice difference is the paper that you use. Um, heavier weight papers feel much, much nicer than lighter weight papers. Um, it, you know, note cards, for example, you know, the, the big note cards are phenomenal as far as feel with a fountain pen. And, uh, this little Schaefer is, uh, is no different. So, uh, the pen of the week is the, uh, is the Schaefer. And, uh, next week I'll, I'll give a report maybe on, on the repairs of my, uh, of my vanishing point. And, uh, you know, we'll keep playing with pens and, uh, maybe throw a segment in every now and then. Well, just because. So today's shave of the day was, oh, it was good. <laughs> That's the only way to really say it. It was just, it was good. Um, you know, every now and then you have one of those. So the shave of the day today was Deluxe Shaving Woodbridge. Now, Woodbridge is lavender, oak moss, and cedar wood. Oh, this one, this one is probably my favorite soap as far as smell goes. And the thing that's interesting about this one is that it also smells very similar to a soap that my grandmother used to use. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons that I like it so much. Because, as you may or may not know, and as I've said several times, the, 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 the ability to smell is the greatest uh, memory enhancer, you know, we, we have a smell memory that is stronger than just about any other memory circuit that we have as human beings. It's just one of the things about being a, a, a person. And so sometimes if we have smells that we really, really like, we carry that on. And when we smell something similar, it's just, it, it's almost automatically enjoyable. So, Woodbridge, Woodbridge, again, lavender, oak moss, and cedar wood, a very nicely balanced, uh, soap. Ah, good stuff. Anyhow, the, uh, and of course it uses the same base and, uh, and lathers very, very nicely. Now, one of the reasons that this, uh, that this morning's shave of the day was just, well, just good, uh, it really was, is I did what I'd been threatening to do for a while. 
I used a straight razor for most of it and cleaned up and finished up with a single-edged um, gem, my little featherweight. So I used my uh, my uh, my Bell uh, straight razor and uh, and then finished up with the uh, with the gem. And that combination it gives or gave gave me a fabulous shave because the the what I found is the straight razors do a much better job at getting a close shave in the areas that they are good at giving a close shave in. For example, cheeks, chin, you know, under the nose. Um, those are areas that, for me anyhow, a straight razor excels. Now, the problem areas that I have with a straight razor, which is my neck, I then can can clean up. I can get most of it with the straight razor, but then I can clean it up with the single-edged. And the combination, you walk away with a shave that is exceedingly close without the razor burn that you would get from having to go over and over with the same razor that's not really getting the job done well. And so that just, ah, it just, it went well. Now, Woodbridge, and, and it's interesting that, that it's this way, but, but Woodbridge has a purple label. And it just so happens that it's got kind of a floral woody scent to it, which is very similar to, uh, to Jaloux Veiled Flowers, which also has a floral scent <laughs> and a purple label. <laughs> it's just kind of curious that, uh, that those two, uh, made it up. So I finished the shave with some Jaloux aftershave and, uh, off we went to the, uh, to the old donut factory, walking out the door with a freshly ironed shirt looking spiffy and sharp. And wondering, well, what am I going to take on today and be successful at? So, good stuff. Good shave. Good shirt. Yeah, we can do this. So I have a good time at work. And, and one of the things that I enjoy is that I have a colleague at work who is... <laughs> I don't know if it's uh if it's a good thing or a bad thing but he's a lot like me. Um he is always looking to learn. He is always seeking out. He is always uh experimenting. You know, for him uh, just like for me, sometimes whether you're successful or not doesn't really matter. It's whether or not you've learned in the process. And we get to talking all the time. And, uh, for example, um, this weekend he was, he was looking at, uh, at the condenser on his air conditioner and having to do some stuff on the, uh, on the motor for the, uh, for the condenser of his air conditioner. And he was looking at, uh, the starting capacitor. And what he has said on several occasions is that there's really nobody else that he works with that understands what it is to do something like that. It, it, they, they don't understand, first off, why you would even bother, why you wouldn't just, well, call somebody. And for him, it's like, wait a minute, I don't want to call somebody. I want to know how to do it myself. And part of the, part of the fun, part of the intrigue of the whole operation and orientation is because, well, you're learning. And, you know, why do you need a capacitor and what makes it tick and what size and how does it hook up and, and why and, you know, all of this. And what he finds is that for the people that he interacts with is that there is a, there are a, um, a couple of, of things that, that pop into his head. There is a, there is a, a lack of, of desire. There is a, you know, the comments that he hears are, well, why would you even bother? Why do you, you know, why don't you just call somebody and let them do it? Why don't, you know, why don't you just buy a new one? You know, something like that. And, and for him, um, you know, he, he wonders, and, and we've talked about this, is that in his experience, this has been a shift, a shift in attitudes. Whereas if you were to look at the bell curve, if you will, of the population, it used to be that, that people fixed things and people enjoyed the journey and people were, uh, you know, always looking and learning and experimenting and building and, and trying. 
Whereas now people are have shifted to throw it away, call somebody, don't bother with it, just get a new one. Why, you know, and and there has been that shift, and it has been across all spectrums, whether it be a phone, a computer, an air conditioning unit, a refrigerator, you know, all of these units. You know, all of these, all of these things, cars are the same way. Now, a lot of people sit there and say, well, you know, the car has changed. It's gotten much more complicated. Okay. So I'll ask the question. If you had to, uh, replace and rebuild the brakes on your car, whether front brakes or rear brakes, whether uh, disc or drum, would you know how to do that? Would you know where to begin? Or have you gotten to the point where you have to take it to somebody because you don't know? Not necessarily because you don't have time, but because, well, you just don't know. Or that it's never crossed your mind to even go that direction and do it yourself. Or even find out about it. And then you wonder how often, you know, how many times does somebody go into a dealer with a car that has a problem that's, well, relatively simple, and because they just don't know, by the time they walk out, they've spent $3,000, and and they think they're getting a good deal because of what they've been told, but they really have no clue whether they've been told the truth or not. They hope that they have, but they don't know. And it's that shift in attitudes that we started talking about. And what what dawned on both of us as we were having this conversation is that to a certain extent, it kind of points to to the fact that being in this mode, being in this 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 place on this bell curve where where you're not investigating where you're not learning where you're you know over there in the throwaway crowd and and the get somebody else to do it well you know apparently that's a very lonely journey because have you ever noticed that well everybody wants to take you in that same direction with them and isn't that odd you know you would think that if it was something good they would want to take you with them because well it was really better, but they'll never really say that, at least not in my experience. So apparently it's a, it's, it's a lonely journey and, uh, well, they don't want to be alone or at least not feel that they're alone. And, and, and that kind of leads me to my next conclusion in that it's almost like a low key mob mentality situation. They don't know if they're right. They think they are. They have this instinctive understanding that if there's enough of them there, then, yeah, it has to be right. Right? Because, well, everybody thinks that way. And if somebody doesn't, well, they're the oddballs, right? Because there's a whole bunch of us here that are all, well, in this same boat that somebody said we were supposed to be in. And that boat is, you don't have time. You know, just just throw it away. Buy a new one. You don't have time to make a lather. You know, throw away that old brush and that, that, that you know, soap. I mean, come on. Who does that? Get the goo in a can. It's good. All you got to do is press a button. It's no big deal. And if everybody's doing it, the ones that aren't, they're the oddballs. Right? And then, you you know, you think, okay, where else have we been persuaded to think that way? You know, look at our refrigerators. How many people actually repair a refrigerator because they understand it? Or is it just one of these things where when that one, you know, goes out that you don't even bother, you just instinctively go down to the store and buy a new one and replace it. Next thing you know, it's real good for the durable goods manufacturers because they're selling lots and lots of refrigerators, but potentially they're selling an $800 or $900 refrigerator for a $50 part. Hmm... You know, it's, it's just, it's just curious. Fundamentally, I have to ask the question, why would you pay somebody to do something that you could do yourself? I understand if you don't have the time. I understand if you're in a situation where you really don't have the time. But there are some things that don't take a lot of time. 
they just take a little bit of knowledge and education. And it's not like we don't have that knowledge and education at our fingertips with, with things like YouTube and, and libraries and, and the Internet. I mean, my gosh, you can look up everything. But nobody wants to take the time because the, everybody's over there in the throwaway crowd. And, and to a certain extent, you kind of look at them and go, okay, um, why... Why do they not feel happy necessarily about where they're at? I mean, if you talk to them, you know, do you enjoy throwing stuff away when you can potentially repair it? And they'll tell you after a little bit of discussion, no, they don't. They just don't know how. Which is just, it's almost like, how can you not know if you have so much information at your fingertips? You know, it's... uh it's just curious. It's almost like we've lost the ability to go out and search and research and learn and, and find out new things. And, you know, we want it to be provided to us. We don't want to go and, and look. We find somebody, for example, that has, you know, good skills in, well, we even call it a name, Google Foo. You know, if you have good search capabilities on Google, you're almost a, you know, a magician because, well, you can do that. Well, Anybody can. It just takes a little bit of, you know, practice, knowledge. Kind of like changing brakes on a car, you know, shaving with a straight razor, making a lather. It's all the same stuff. You know, it's, it's all the same concept. So, you know, oftentimes, like I said, we, we, we get to talking about this stuff and, and we wonder to each other, how did we get here? And then you realize that we got here because somebody sold enough people, not everybody, but enough people, the idea that throwing something away was good and buying new was better and, and new and improved is always, always, always the way to go. And that's why people buy by the millions these ballpoint pens that really, when you write with them, feel like garbage. And if you lose one, it's no big deal because they're cheap and it's, and it's, you know. And the people that use the fountain pens are looked at like the oddballs when the ink flows and it's smooth and it feels good in the hand and, and it makes letters that are, you know, not made with a ballpoint but made with a fountain pen with a nib that makes almost calligraphy-like letters. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing and you really enjoy it and it's like, wow, this is cool. And they're the oddballs. They're the ones that everybody looks at and goes, What? Fountain pen? Who the heck uses one of those? What are you, weird? Kind of like they do sometimes when, well, we talk about shaving. Well, that concludes this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you have some suggestions or would like a topic covered, drop me an email at brushandsoapandblade at gmail.com or give me a call at 864-372-6234 or contact us on Twitter at Brush and Blade. You can also visit us at our blog, brushandsoapandblade.wordpress.com. As always, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher. Do you remember a time when things were not so rushed? A time when doing things the correct way took time and patience. A time when our society was not obsessed by cell phones or the latest digital toy. Wet shaving is a task that can be enjoyable if you take the time to do it right. It's not something that should be rushed. It's something that needs attention to detail, something that can actually be enjoyed instead of being a chore. We at Deluxe Shaving Company understand this, and we want to help you enjoy this experience. Give us an opportunity to be part of your morning routine, and you won't be disappointed. The Deluxe Shaving Company's foundation is based on traditional values and a hard work ethic. We're a small company, not a large corporation, and we like it that way. Being small allows us to be maneuverable and respond instantly to a changing market. It also allows our customers to have direct contact with us. Our shaving creams are produced in the USA by a skilled artisan. Every batch of our shaving cream is aged 
until it is just right. Once ready, they are all hand-blended with essential and fragrance oils. Then the jars are filled, one by one. Even the labels are applied manually without the help of modern machinery. This process takes us a long time, but sometimes it takes a long time to do things the right way. The Lux Shaving Company's product line covers a wide spectrum of scents, from earthy woods to bright, crisp citrus to fresh floral scents. Our shaving cream comes in large 5-ounce containers that are filled right to the top. All of our products are tallow-based and contain palm oil, coconut oil, olive oil, and kaolin to give you a close, comfortable shave and moisturized post-shave feel. The performance of our shaving cream can be fine-tuned to your liking by customizing your combination of brush loading and the amount of water used to lather. Our creams are capable of handling a lot of water for a slicker shave or less water for more cushion and protection. The Lux shaving cream does not clog your razor and it rinses away easily. The scents used in our shaving cream really develop and evolve when lathered. Your shaved den will be filled with the wonderful scents of our deluxe shaving creams. Our products are available exclusively from our website at www.deluxeshaving.com. We offer free shipping for orders over $50. Have a deluxe shave.